What we wanted to do in the form of a debriefing, rather than have you kind of do a rundown of your lesson, um, which at this point of the day might feel like a bit much, is maybe just to share some of the things that you noticed, um, something that maybe you um, realized through this process, um, something you got excited about from this process that uh, might also be a shared experience or trigger something for somebody else in the room. Does anyone have anything that stands out to them? Yeah. It's really obvious that normally when I prepare a class, you know, there are some of these pedagogical acts, you know, that I tend to do. Yeah. You know, for example, I tend a lot to experiencing the familiar versus experiencing the new, analyzing, analyzing functionally, analyzing critically, you know. So actually, like, seeing this here, you know, it helps me a lot to try to fill in also, you know, the other stuff, you know, and to do more different things, you know, than what I normally do. Yeah, that's very much my experience as well, and that's why, for me, I'm an applied person. These, are, so these to me are kind of tools for thinking with. They're reminders to myself to try to, to vary the kinds of experiences that I'm giving my students and the kinds of opportunities. Um, and we were also talking about that some of these we tend to go to more in the beginning levels and some of these more in the advanced levels, right? So remembering that they actually are all important and possible to be integrated at all of those different levels um, is important. And, and I would add to that, um, if you get the opportunity to look through the, my textbook, um, which most of the instructional language is in English. So uh, even if you don't read French, you, you, know, you should be able to follow uh, what the, and, and if you read the, the um, teacher's guide, it really explains, outlines the, the, the approach. Um, I did follow the same sequence because I was, in fact, keeping in mind this idea of a textbook and I was trying to make it something that would be easily patterned um, for teachers to, to, to kind of plug into as a, as, as a kind of, let's say, method as a part of the approach. But I suppose if I were to do this again now, it, it, that enabled me to understand what my, what my process was. But if I were to do it now, I would um, probably approach it different, each, each uh, uh, unit uh, somewhat differently in terms of the sequence. But, both of those things work. Sometimes it's very helpful to work through um, a particular sequence. I mean, it, it, you know, in communicative language teaching, you learn a particular sequence, let's say, of, of how to structure your lessons. So it's not that, um, that that can't be done fruitfully, but it's also very helpful to step outside of that and then to, to break it down in different ways, approach it in different ways. When I was doing the, exp so, so I did an activity for experiencing the familiar and then experiencing the new. But then I know when I was trying to, to figure out something to do for applying appropriately and applying, appro applying creatively, I noticed that they sort of overlapped. So, you know, like I ended up not knowing, oh, is this experiencing, is this one or the other? Yeah. Is that like, or am I understanding it wrong? These often will overlap. I think they're interconnected. So they're um, ways of focusing our attention a little bit differently. Um, but often they will kind of link into one another, not just in the same quadrant, but we were, I think we were trying to come up with some activities that were conceptualizing, and we kept finding that we were really quickly moving into applying with the kinds of activities we were coming up with. Um, I don't have a problem with that. I don't. Maybe I'm never. I'm not very good at being dogmatic. Um, but I think, insofar as the the point is that it forced you to think about, well, how? What are the choices I'm making? Right? Am I also bringing creativity, maybe, in, and not just worrying about if they're doing something appropriately? I, I think, in that sense, they've done their work as as tools to think with. Um, so. I, I wouldn't worry too much about if you're getting them in the right space, um, but rather using them to kind of think into the different kinds of activities that you might bring in in different moments. Yeah. And, and I think sometimes, and this is just my take, but I think if you're doing it right, they often do move into one another really quickly because that means you're doing something that's integrated and that builds um, rather than sort of isolated tasks that aren't interconnected. But, but there is, I would just said, there is another dimension that it does become helpful when you get into assessment, and we'll look at that more tomorrow, yeah. that you do have ultimately uh, a clear sense um, of what the breakdown is when it comes to the skills, the knowledge bases that you, that you want to assess. So um, it's helpful to have that level of, of clarity of thinking. 
Actually, that's an, um, that's something I'll remember to show tomorrow to pull up, um, but it's on a previous slide. But two of the scholars who've done a lot of the development, it's their vocabulary that I'm borrowing here, um, Cope and Calances, they have, uh, and speaking of open educational resources, they have an entire website that is targeted more at um, education context, not necessarily second language learning context, but they have a lot of resources there. And one of the things that I have that I love when I'm working with instructors and we're doing course objectives is um, basically these categories, and then they have a list of kind of active verbs, sort of evidenceable, demonstrable things that you can assess. And so all often, if, I, if my head gets stuck, I'll go to those, and then I can say, okay, what is my objective? My objective is that um, the learners can compare and contrast definite and indefinite articles. Okay, that's a learning objective I can work with um, and, and assess in some way. So I'll share that website with you tomorrow when we talk about assessment. I want to make one comment about, um, I was watching a lot of people's process, kind of what you were doing, and, and where you started thinking, where your idea came from for a text, and then how you developed it. And so this is, this is a draft, right? You're just playing with ideas at this point. And a lot of you are now, you've got some ideas there, and you're starting to change those ideas, which is where you should be, right? And, um, but I'm seeing like little light bulbs go off. And maybe you're not seeing it, but I'm seeing it. So I want to share with Hilda. I'm going to put her on the spot here. Um, sh she started with a, a text. I guess the idea was to talk about digital, I don't know, devices, phones. And, um, and of course, she came to last year's. So she's ahead of you guys, right? But no, she did. She uh, chose a text. and. Where, how did you find the text, by the way? Um, I just Googled the topic. OK. I, I think Pinterest. OK. Start at Pinterest, OK. I like images, so. Yeah. So she came up with a text. And it's a kind of um, a, a journalistic or an informational text about different kinds of devices. And then she came up with a nut, kind of t thinking about what Chantel had said about thinking sideways or creating some kind of a context for that text. She came up with a comic strip where she had an old telephone and then the new cell phone. And the cell phone was calling the old phone abuela, ha ha, <laughs> which is cute, right? And which is one of the points she was trying to make, that, that there's a history to technology. And that she found all those two pieces. So she's got this intertextuality thing going on. And I walked by and said, that's great. Where does that come from? And I started asking her questions about, is it open? And where did you find it? And she kind of looked like, oh, I don't know. So I came back a half an hour later. And what did you do? Well, I searched for a Creative Commons license. And I found several texts. And now it's open to be shared. So what she did was she kind of made a draft. She found all these cool ideas, put them together. But then she took it another step later and found the same kinds of ideas, but in open text. So that, to me, was a huge moment. Yay! Um, because it, it was like, and that's what we'll, we'll, we'll do more about that tomorrow. Um, a lot of you have chosen closed text. They're copyrighted, which is fine. And then you're writing an open lesson around that. But that was a good example of the place you start does not have to be the place you end up. It's a draft. When you create an open lesson about a closed text and you want, if that's published on our website, we cannot include the text in the lesson. No. You can include the link or you can include the reference. So that means that someone would have to find that text elsewhere, but then see your open lesson about it. The other possibility is to have an open lesson around an open text. And then in that case, we have the text along with your lesson that people can access directly on the site. A couple weeks ago, we had uh, here at Coral, we had about 65 heritage Spanish uh, teachers, from, primarily from the state of Texas. And we had one person who was sharing, um, Jose, I can't remember his last name, from Dallas, Dallas Independent School District. And he had written a lot of the curriculum for foreign languages. And, he was doing everything that we were talking about. They were creating really great activities, great lessons. Um, but he was violating copyright all over the place. He was taking videos from Univision and making really topical, interesting activities. Um, so I was saying, well, what you can do is tweak it a little bit, because you've done a lot of the work. 
So that's kind of uh, so that's what we want to talk to you tomorrow about is making these tweaks to make it even better. So one other thing I didn't mention, the collaborators, our three collaborators, the idea is that we want to give editorial feedback so that and you can give each other feedback on what might work so your lesson gets better and better and better and then it becomes publishable. So sometimes starting with an idea of a text um, is what helps to guide our search for the open text or for other texts. Because a lot of you were doing what I would call pairing, right? Um, we had talked over here about the traditional fairy tale story and then a parody of that fairy tale story. And I know you were working with um, spoken, kind of a spoken essay or a speech um, and then a written essay. So a lot of this, um, a lot of the kind of um, things that you were noticing come out more clearly when you're pairing two texts together. And sometimes the text you start out with might be that springboard for ideas, but then the text that you pair it with, you can find a really great open resource for that. Any other comments, questions, moments that you want to share? People are brain dead. I know, it's, late. it's a long day. Yeah, it's a long day. So something that um, I noticed when I was planning my lesson um, before coming here, and, I've, and I think I've, I've seen it a little bit by talking about with lessons to other people is um, when it's it's difficult to be strategic about when you use the 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 target language in your lesson. I think that's still something that I've, I've got some of these these other concepts down, but I'm still um, not quite sure about when the target language would be most effective, and that's and with point. certain concepts need to be in English. Um, and, ha and where that, how that um, fits in with your lesson and how that makes a, a coherent lesson with using, with kind of code switching in your lesson. How does that work, I guess? You know, there's been discussion about, can't do all of this in, 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 in language classes. And I would say, again, going back to the example and starting where you're at with, let's say, a textbook, is that when I, when I created the Le Littéraire dans le Quotidien as a complement to Français Interactif, which is a textbook, if you have, for example, a two-week period of time in which you cover a chapter, this is one part of it, right? So it might be two days of work, including two or three days of work, with homework over it, whatever. But that would be where, you're, where you might need to use English. But the rest of the time, um, when, you're, when your focus is, let's say, more explicitly on oral, oral, or, or, or whatever, those things, you know, those are, those are the moments. But it's really about that reading and understanding of language and that playfulness of language. So it's one part. It's not meant to be the whole thing. So do keep that in mind. Uh, on the question of um, uh, which code, if you want a really long answer to that, I would recommend the book Code Choice by my colleague in German studies, Glenn Levine, if you want something good to read. Because it exactly takes on this question of it's not sort of can we use English or not, but it's when and why. And so usually the way I challenge myself is I ask myself first, can I do it in German? Or kind of what would they need for, for me to be able to do it in German? And I find, I mean, this might be where people have different experiences, but I find in the beginning levels, this is often the place where I get stuck and say, I say, no, I can't, quite, I can't quite do it yet. But by intermediate, if I sometimes give them some language to work with, then I can start to do it in German. Um, but it's always the kind of, I start from the expectation of, can I do it? And then sometimes the moment is, the answer is just, I can't. Like There's something in the objectives where I really need them to notice something. And so switching to English for a short period makes the most sense. Um, I find, I don't know if other people have this different experiences, but if, I, if we switch to English a lot, um, the students get frustrated because they, they want to use the German as much as possible. And, and so that's kind of how I keep myself anchored as well.